Due to the way the COVID-19 pandemic has changed my personal life, I'm not really able to spend a lot of research time, long research time in preparation for making long form videos. So I suggested to my patrons and to uh, some of my other friends, uh, should I try to produce uh, less formal, less preparation, impromptu content, such as a Q&A. And uh, the result of the polls were yes. So this is the first Q&A session for the old school PC. And uh, for this series of videos, essentially you can reply in the comments with any of your questions for the next video. You can ask me anything at all about um, software preservation and archival, uh, restoring vintage computers, um, the vintage, uh, the IBM PC and the first decade of PC and compatibles computing, what it was like to work in a software store, what it's like to program for vintage machines, anything that I'm known for, please feel free to leave a comment. So. Uh, and I'll try to get to it in the next video. So let's uh, barrel on through and read some of the questions that I got um, on Twitter. From Carlos Texiera, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Apologies if I'm not. What is your favorite DOS booter game ever? Not just from a technical standpoint, but also the most fun you had. Well, there's four ways to answer this. Um, favorite DOS and booter games and favorite from a technical and fun standpoint. And there's way too many to try to pick a favorite across the entire era of PC gaming in DOS. I mean, there was, you know, the, the PC CGA era up until about, I don't know, 1987. And then from like 87 to 89, maybe 86 to 89, there was like Tandy and EGA and 286. And then from 89.90 on to 93, let's say it was 386, and it, there's too many eras. So for the purpose of this question, I'm going to limit my answer to um, 81 to 87, which is like the IBM PC and CGA era. For the best booter from a technical standpoint, um, in my opinion, hands down, is Super Zaxxon. Super Zaxxon was coded, I wish I knew the coder, I couldn't figure out who the coder was, but it was someone working for Sega, and they uh, did a fantastic trick with the CGA start address registers that allow the um, synchronize their update of the screen to um, moving it uh, with the start address registers to shift it downward, but then they quickly repainted on the side and on the bottom, a status display. So it's not immediately obvious what they're doing. And all of this is timed to racing the beam uh, to ensure that the updates happen before the next refresh. CGA only has one video page. Um, I've put up currently, right now in the corner of this video, footage of Super Zaxxon running on the original hardware in 16 color composite mode. And it doesn't look like a PC game at all. And for those of us who know that there's only one video page, it's mind-blowing. So that's an obvious win. For fun, the most fun booter I've ever played is Archon. Uh, and that is because uh, not only do I enjoy the game uh, myself, but it was one of the few games that uh, myself and one of my children uh, were able to play uh, on a semi-regular basis. And uh, he's fantastic at video games way better than than I ever was yet I could still hold my own against him in Archon because for all of the twitch and reaction skills he had over me I had strategy over him so very many fond memories of playing Archon with uh, with my son Max um, for DOS tech the most impressive DOS tech of that era um, I'm actually gonna jump forward two years to 1989 and say Turbo Champions now, hardly any of you know what this game is. It is a pole position clone uh, created for the PC by Graham Devine. Graham Devine, you may remember as, uh, first of all, having a very long history of programming games, but most notably, Graham Devine created uh, The Seventh Guest and The Eleventh Hour, including the video tech in those games. So very technically proficient. And in Turbo Champions, which is sort of a no-name uh, I mean, a low-budget Mastertronic game, I think, that was never even finished. He told me over email he never finished it, and they still published it. That has real-time scaling of sprites, and it runs at a really decent clip. It's a shame the gameplay itself isn't finished, um, because it doesn't feel like a very fun racing game, and there's hardly any audio. But 
Um, just in terms of sheer tech, it updates at like four or five frames a second with scaling sprites. Very impressive. And then in terms of fun for DOS, uh, this is going to be a strange choice. Um, again, 81 to 87, Hack. Hack, not Hacker, but Hack. Hack was ported from the Unix source code by Don Neller in 1985, and it is an early roguelike. Uh, it came out after Rogue um, and before NetHack. So it is essentially the single-player pre-NetHack version of that game. And I played it on and off for 22 years until I finally finished it. Uh, and it was a really deep game back then, and it's one of the games that I still keep coming back to when I want to just simply relax. All right, another question from Carlos. And this time it's an 8086 assembly question. What was your most mind-blowing moment programming when you maybe you discovered a much more efficient algorithm? Um, I think it was making 8088 domination when I realized that I could get faster screen updates and more predictable screen updates in terms of how much time it took to, to do the updates. When I realized that instead of reading data and processing that data to change the screen, if I read executable code off the drive and just told it to go, like just execute that code, I think that was the, the moment for me. Um, and so that animation playback system isn't really an animation playback system. It's actually a compiler, and it writes uh, each frame is a program that does the updates, and it just gets executed. Um, I've since now begun to think about that, and I might actually be able to get it back down to data with the same execution speed, but that'll probably be a subject for a different video. Another question from Carlos. Uh, what was your most challenging or rewarding piece of software that you cracked or reverse engineered? Well, uh, probably the most rewarding crack was my very first crack, which was Ractor, which I happen to have right here. And uh, forgive me here if I get the... I'm going to refocus on Ractor, and hopefully you can see it just fine. Ractor is less of a game and more of an Eliza clone where, uh, with a strange sense of humor, sort of a Monty Python-esque uh, sense of humor. Uh, Mindscape 1984. This is, in fact, my original copy. And, uh, focus on me again. And Ractor, uh, it wasn't a clever crack. Uh, honestly, I think I found like a Prolox signature and I followed some tutorial text file I found on a BBS for cracking Prolox or something like that. I don't remember the specifics, but when it worked, that was, that was elation. It was fantastic. Um, most rewarding crack? Uh, the quick and dumb ones are the rewarding because when you can crack something in like five minutes or one minute, um, those are fun. Maybe not rewarding, but fun. Uh, the first one I can remember that, uh, doing that, was a Space Station Oblivion. Forgive me here while I get this ready. So Space Station Oblivion is the uh, Activision US release of uh, Driller. Uh, the European game Driller, uh, both of which were a, uh, using the Free Space system, uh, sorry, Freescape system, the 3D system used to create a lot of adventure games uh, on 8-bit systems. So I think it originated on the ZX Spectrum and of course was ported to the Commodore 64 and others. And uh, this was rewarding because it was the very first time I had a fast crack uh, where um, it was incredibly stupid. There was a program that launched and checked uh, the disk for the protection, it did, that did the protection check, and then it branched out to different executables, one for CGA, one for EGA, and one for Tandy. And those executables weren't encrypted and had no protection. So this essentially dumb little menu program that did the check, I just got rid of it and replaced it with a batch file that said, type this for CGA, type this for EGA, type this for Tandy. So uh, those are fast. Some other rewarding cracks that are super fast are things like when there's a doc check and you realize that the program uh, written, <clears throat> the program was written in C and C uses uh, null as the string terminator. So uh, it's really fun to just go in there and replace all of the doc check words, if they're not encrypted, with nulls. And then that way, no matter what the word is, you just hit enter. 
so you're submitting an empty string, which is null, and then it goes to look up the string, and it matches null immediately, and then the game works. So I think the first game my friend Brian ever cracked like that was MechWarrior. The first game I ever cracked like that was Mean Streets. Um, although Mean Streets was written in Assembler, not C, but it still used null as the terminator, so who knows. And uh, most rewarding reverse engineer? Uh, I did a lot of research into digitized uh, audio, specifically real sound, um, maybe five or six years ago, because I was going to write an article on it, and I was researching all the prior art. And uh, real sound as a patent should never have been, I mean, I love access, I love access, but they should not have pat patented real sound and then tried to strong arm other game publishers to not use their own methods because there was a lot of prior art I found out in this research. And going back and back throughout all this, going back to Crazy Cars and Whizball and um, even um, Castle Wolfenstein, which all have these digitized sound routines and they uh, came out well before the first real sound game. Um, that was very interesting to see all the different methods. And maybe someday there will be a video or an article write up on it still. Chris Asik, a.k.a. Ancient DOS Games. How does copy protection factor into software preservation? That is a deceptively simple and incredibly complex question to answer. And the answer is that it really depends on who you talk to. It depends on their philosophy. So, for example, some people believe that if you can uh, hack up the program to get it running in an emulator and it shows the title screen and you can move stuff around and it looks like it's working, that's good enough. Other people believe that you should be able to preserve the bits without modifying it. So that would mean getting a flux level transition archive system like a CryoFlux or a SuperCard Pro uh, for Apple, for example, the, the Apple Sauce, any of these, these types of systems, to do a flux level bit archival of the disk and run that in an emulator with perfect floppy protection, with perfect floppy emulation. And then that is perfect. And that usually works pretty well. Uh, if you talk to yet more people, they will say a perfect archival of the game without anything modified, but without protection, so that you can write it back to a disk and use it on you know, authentic hardware. Some people say that that is the best way. And honestly, there's no one perfect method. But to answer the question directly, how does copy protection factor into it? It doesn't. Um, because at a basic level, you can do a CryoFlux or a SuperCard Pro or an Applesauce dump of the disk and then you have everything, including the protection, and you can then later choose to do what you want. Run it with protection intact, try to write it back to a disk, try to crack it, whatever. Dan Pollocker writes, could you talk about programming, sound design, and composing on the PC speaker? I could, but thankfully, uh, one of my colleagues, Shiru, has already done that last year in a wonderful article that he wrote about the making of his uh, his music disc, System Beeps, which runs on an original IBM PC. And he wrote about all sorts of stuff from why you can use uh, faster update rates than the, than the screen refresh rate. Like if you update the speaker at 120 hertz, um, you can get more gradual <coughs> slides, portamentos, uh, better... Uh, resolution on your faked uh, percussion sounds, that kind of thing. He wrote this great article. I'm linking to it in the description, and you should definitely read that. Josh Malone writes, what are the best demos for a Gusless 38620? Now, by Gusless, he means a, a system without a Gravis ultrasound card. So th why is that question relevant? Because the Gravis ultrasound, at least for the demo scene, allowed you to load all of your instrument samples into the Gravis ultrasound RAM and then play it as if you were playing a MIDI instrument, which is very little CPU time. If you don't have a Gravis ultrasound, if you have a PC speaker or a, a parallel port DAC or a sound blaster, uh, trying to mix all of the music sounds together to output through that one stream is CPU intensive. So he's wondering, 
are there any demos for a system as slow as a 3D620 that doesn't have a Gravis that would still run okay? And thankfully, there are plenty. The first one I would immediately urge you to check out is Amnesia by Renaissance. Uh, you may know them uh, later for creating the game Zone 66. Amnesia's primary coder was Tran, uh, Thomas Pytel, and he uh, was he owned a 386 SX16, and he was unhappy that uh, in real mode, when you tried to use 3D6 registers and 3D6 access, that things were slow, but in protected mode, you didn't need those extra uh, 66 and 67H opcodes, and things ran faster. So uh, he wrote P mode, which is a protected mode um, wrapper that I will get to in a in a future question in this very video. And <clears throat> that way he could take advantage of all the RAM and also run things as fast as possible. And Amnesia was born on that system, a 386SX20. Not only that, uh, sorry, 386SX16. Another reason you should try to run Amnesia is because it's one of the very few demos that not only mix together digital sound channels to output through the single sound, uh, the digital sound channel, the sound blaster, but it also uses the nine FM channels at the same time. So you have this really rich, full sound. And uh, although Screen Tracker 3 could do that, it was Renaissance's own tracker, an internal one called, uh, you may be familiar with their 669 tracker. This tracker was actually 670. And uh, I have a copy of it, but um, I'm not allowed to release it. Uh, and it's kind of buggy anyway, so you wouldn't really want to want to use it. Um, Scream Tracker 3 would be a better way to compose this kind of music, but Amnesia was the first demo to do that. And it does it very well. So Amnesia of Renaissance. Another one, Crystal Dream from Triton is uh, they, that team eventually became uh, Starbreeze Studios, known for like um, the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, that amazing game on the original Xbox, if you remember that. And of course, they've continued to make games uh, throughout. Um, Crystal Dream, not Crystal Dream 2, which really requires a 486 to shine, but the original Crystal Dream has wonderful four-voice mixed music. It does all of its screen updates um, in 16-color planar mode, and is smart enough to do things like update the slower 3D objects in the um, background while the star field is on a, an interrupt and runs at the full frame rate all the time. It's just, it's a wonderful demo. Just watch it. Um, another one is Unreal by Future Crew. Not Second Reality, the one before it. Um, there are portions of Unreal that really require a th 33 megahertz, 3D6DX33 to shine but uh, the majority of the demo will run just fine on a 3D620. Uh, also, uh, one of my personal favorites, Vec Demo from Ultraforce. Uh, sorry, Vector Demo, but we all called it Vec Demo because that was the name of the zip file. Vector Demo from Ultraforce, written by uh, Arian Bruce, if I remember correctly. Uh, you may know him as the programmer for the Jazz Jackrabbit series later on. Uh, this demo came out in 1991. And it was uh, what we called metal shading. So it wasn't environment mapping, which is kind of like a chrome reflection type thing, but it's metal shading, which it was um, very popular in the very, very early days of exploring virtual reality on DOS systems. And it's essentially a metal-like gradient that shifts based on the angle of the surface that comes at you. It's, it's very silly, but this is a demo scene term. Cameron Brett writes, why does Quake for DOS's gameplay run too fast on modern hardware, despite WinQuake running it at the correct speed? So I'm not initially qualified to answer that, but I know someone who is, uh, Fabian, my friend Fabian, who wrote these wonderful um, DOS game graphics black book series uh, the first one is on Wolfenstein 3D. The second one is on Doom. They are the deepest dives ever into both of those games, and they explain exactly the history behind them, the history of their development, uh, and then through analyzing the source code and other you know, research, he explains them all beautifully, how they work. They're great books. You should absolutely pick them, out, pick them up. Um, and I'll have a link to both of those in the description. And this is not an advertisement. I'm not being paid. 
Um, I did happen to to work with Fabian on um, the Wolfenstein book extensively, and uh, my name's in the acknowledgments, which is wonderful to see. Um, so if anyone would know, it would be him. And sure enough, uh, he did a very quick code review, and he absolutely found why that is. And essentially, it comes down to the DOS version will do a call for the system time. And depending on how much time has elapsed from game logic and render to the next loop of that, it will advance the internal time counter by that much and then keep going. The problem is on really fast systems, you'll read the time, and let's just say it's one, two, three, four, five. Just bear with me. And then it renders very quickly on a fast system and goes and reads the time, and it's still one, two, three, four, five. Well, the game engine in DOS, if it gets that condition where it reads this time and then it gets the exact same value when it reads it again, it still advances the internal game frame by 0.1. And you can see right now on the screen that logic that does it. So it's kind of a flaw in the design of the DOS source code. Jake S. Del Mastro writes, what's your favorite 8086 instruction and what's your favorite creative use of it? All of the one byte opcodes are my favorites. Um, in particular, uh, move SW is great because it's a single opcode, it's one byte long, and it reads two bytes from DSSI, writes two bytes to ESDI, and then increments DI and SI by two. So it's it does so much in one instruction. So it's kind of my pocket favorite, but that's kind of a lame answer. The, the correct answer is really XLAT, which stands for XLAT, which stands for translate. And it's essentially a way to very quickly look up an entry in a translation table and copy it back into the register. So uh, it's the equivalent, XLAT in one instruction will take the value of AL, add it to BX, and pull the value out from BX plus AL, essentially, and put it back into AL. So it's a way to very quickly... So if BX points to a translation table, you can take a value in AL, run XLAT, and it's immediately flipped with its value, its position in that translation table. And uh, my most creative use of that, I think, was um, with the help of my demo programming friend of many years, Andrew Jenner, who helped me optimize my Rotozoomer code. And uh, here is that Rotozoomer code on screen so you can see how it was used. Mike Irwin asks, how to start coding in 386 using a flat 32-bit memory model? I see some old resources, but want to know as a 21st century coder. So let's cover both old resources and new. Um, don't discount the old resources because um, uh, they were current and complete back then because the information was relevant. And when it comes to an old resource, you really can't do any better than Tran's P-Mode Extender. And I'll have a link to that in the description. Uh, Tran, uh, who I've already mentioned as the main coder of the Demo Group Renaissance, uh, frustrated with the performance on his 386SX, came up with a, a system to easily enter protected mode and work within it. And the P-Mode, uh, the original version of P-Mode, was written specifically for assembler projects. Uh, so definitely grab that. Look at the example programs, uh, read the docs. There, there's not many, but there's enough to get you started. That's really a great way to do it. Um, another way to do it is, uh, and then this is going to be newer resources now. Um, if you're not married to the idea of writing it in assembler, but you just want to use 32-bit protected mode, flat address space, the whole bit in general, um, you can use a modern high-level language that still has DOS compile targets. For example, OpenWatcom is an excellent choice. You can you can create, you can use the exact same system that, um, uh, let's say, Doom used. For example, if you use OpenWatcom, it usually produces an executable that requires the DOS 4GW extender, uh, and you'll remember that from uh, from playing Doom in the DOS days. Uh, you could also use Free Pascal if you're curious about that. Um, that also has a 32-bit output output target. Both of those systems have debuggers. They um, have their excellent code generation. Um, 
I know Pascal's sort of a strange choice, but it has really kind of a nice IDE. You can't work in DOS, but you can work in the IDE and then, you know, cross-compile. Um, and they also both allow you, both OpenWatcom and FreePascal allow you to inline assembler as well. So if you don't want to specifically write assembler modules and try to link them in, you can just do parts of your program in using, you know, 32-bit registers and accessing all of the segment registers, FS, GS. Um, so that's one way to start. Um, and probably another modern resource to start, and I'm not familiar with this, but I know it's a thing that exists, is FASM or the flat 32-bit assembler, FASM, and I'll have a link to that in the description as well. And that is a full-featured system. I believe it has an IDE, and it allows you to create 32-bit protected mode directly from FASM itself. Brassic Gamer asks, what are the top three demos for the IBM AT that weren't written more recently? Okay, so he's asking for, were there any demos that worked on the original IBM AT uh, back in the day? And... So for the purpose of answering this question, a typical IBM AT is either 6 MHz 286 or an 8 MHz 286 with EGA. That was EGA was typical for an IBM AT, uh, at least in the United States. I don't know about you know other countries that had that had it, but it was either monochrome or it was EGA. So I can only remember two: um, Atom by Sorcerers, uh, and not Atom, but A T O M Atom, and it doesn't necessarily require EGA, but it does. It is targeted for an AT or later, and some of you may have run this in an emulator configured for XT, and it works fine. Or you may have uh, run it on a Turbo XT, and it may it may have run fine. But it really was designed for an IBM AT because uh, on the IBM AT, that was when that key that keyboard, the Model M, was introduced although they actually had an 83 version of it, an 83 key version of the keyboard as well, that had the numlock, uh, caps lock, and scroll lock lights. And when you run Atom on that system, the lights blink in unison to the music. Um, and that will only happen on an AT or later. So it really was designed for the AT or later. Um, I think it also blinks the floppy drive lights too, um, but I don't remember. And again, this video is supposed to be no post-production, so I'm not supposed to spend hours grabbing a, an AT out of uh, storage and testing it for you, so I suggest you test it yourself and see. And then the other one is, of course, the very famous, or at least famous to me, very near and dear to my heart, Mega Demo by The Space Pigs. That was released in uh, December 26th, I believe December 26th, 1990. And it was less than a week later, uh, I think the first week of January, that it showed up on a Chicago BBS, and I grabbed it and downloaded it, and my life changed forever. Uh, the Space Pigs Mega Demo was engineered for a 286 with EGA. It has settings for a slow 286 and a fast 286. It also has settings for EGA and VGA. But if you have um, an 8 megahertz AT, and EGA, you're supposed to be able to run it with low sound quality. And if you have a 6 MHz AT, you can probably run it with no sound, and I'm sure it'll run just fine. So, very fun multi-part demo, and uh, changed my life forever. It's the demo that got me in the demo scene, so I suggest you check it out. Pilosis asks, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, what is the best way of accurately measuring CPU clock speed on older PCs? So by older, I'm assuming you mean um, anything that was below the Pentium, because the Pentium, in, and actually I think one mod, a couple of models of 46, but it was with the Pentium really that the timestamp counter uh, was introduced in Intel's line of CPUs. And the timestamp counter is the number of cycles per power on. Using that, it's very easy to figure out what the megahertz speed is, and you can access uh, the timestamp counter on the Pentium with uh, RDTSC, that opcode. So 46 and lower, how did you do it? Well, um, you may not like this answer, but it's you did it stupidly, which was you got a system, let's say a 286, and you came up with some metric instructions, like some sequence of instructions that, uh, ex you know, that exercised mull and div and moving memory and whatever. And you could you read the timer at the start of executing that sequence, and then you read the timer at the end of it, and now you had the number of timer ticks it took that code to run, and you knew you ran it on a 6 MHz 286, just as an example. So if you ran it on another 286, and it completed in half the time, that means 
that 286 must have been a 12 MHz 286, you know, 6 MHz divided by 0.5. And that's essentially it, meaning there's no one routine to do it because there was too much diversity in the PC world. There was, you could have in one class of system an 8088 an, or an 8086 or an NECV20 or an NECV30. All four of those CPUs have different performance characteristics. The 8086 did not perform exactly the same as the 8088 at the same clock speed because the 8086 had um, a bigger prefetch queue and it also operated, it also did a word move in four cycles as opposed to um, two byte moves in eight cycles like the 8088 does. So, so the way people did it back then, and the way I do it in, in the top bench benchmark, is that I have a block of code that I ran on 8088s, and I know how long that takes at the, at the speed I tested it on. Another one for 286, another one for 386, another one for 486, and that's, that's it, essentially. It's really kind of dumb. So uh, that is also why sometimes... Uh, you can run these programs, and if you're running something kind of strange, like a like a Make It 486 SLC upgrade chip or something weird, it can report the wrong speed because the original programmer didn't have that chip, or is detecting it incorrectly, like like it's detecting it as a 386 by mistake and running the 386 metric, um, and so you get the wrong value back. So, um, sorry, there's no elegant answer for that. Finally, William D. Jones asks, is it possible via careful coding to write non-toy applications on the IBM PC that will consistently run without crashing with DRAM refresh enabled? I love this question because it's so nerdy. All right, so let's explain. What is DRAM refresh? On the original IBM PC, they used dynamic RAM chips or DRAMs, and dynamic RAM needs uh, a constant voltage to retain its contents. When the designers of the IBM PC created it, they um, built, they dedicated one of the timer channels to constantly, at a very high rate of speed, interrupting the CPU and telling the CPU to read um, a byte from each bank of RAM, which, and the act of reading it, you know, uh, reading a byte energizes, re-energizes the RAM. So it, it was chosen, I don't know if it was exactly one byte per bank, but the, the point of it was that it would read something across all the RAM, across all the lines, and then that would keep it energized. So uh, a lot of people don't know that, that the original IBM PC, you know, your, your poor 8088 is constantly being interrupted to do something stupid um, just so that the RAM doesn't all fade to zero. So... It was a common technique in magazines of the day to put out these speed up your PC uh, very short programs that would reduce the, the rate at which the DRAM was refreshed, leaving you more CPU time. Now, you can only do this a little bit because the whole point of it is to not lose your RAM. If you reduce the refresh rate too low, your RAM fades and the computer crashes. So these programs would like reduce it like one timer division or two two timer division ticks like like very carefully, and if you ran a benchmark, it would say 1.0 speed, and then you would run this program, and now your benchmark says 1.05 speed. Oh wow, you've sped it up five percent. Whoop de do. So it's sort of been theorized like, well, what happened if you disabled it completely, and you wrote a program, and your your program intentionally as part of its normal operation would execute out of all the lines or something like that and just the nature of the program running and how it is constructed does what's necessary to keep the DRAM refreshed. So he, the answer is not really because, um, well, you said non-toy applications. Now, is it possible to write a very tight routine or something that, I mean, something specialized, like something dumb in a demo or something? Is it technically possible? Barely. But William specifically said a non-toy application, like a real app. Could a real app disable DRAM and then just through its construction do this? Not really, because a real app is going to have things like blocks of functions where it would be normal to push several values on the stack and then call that function. And then, uh, you know, that function would return and pop stuff off the stack. And 
those operations, I mean, just pushing stuff on the stack, you're only modifying one small amount of RAM and you need to modify or you need to read or write all of it in order to refresh the DRAM. So in the time it takes you to push a couple things on the stack and call a routine, you're already out of time. Now, that's by the book, um, but we found out when we wrote 88 miles per hour that there's a section in 88 miles per hour where we want to synchronize something with the screen. And the DRAM refresh is a timer divisor of 72, but the screen has this nice 76 cycles per scan line. And so uh, we found out that you could relax it a little bit so that the two would match up and not screw up the on-screen effect or screw up the digitized sound output. And the DRAM was still fine. And then we started experimenting more on the original IBM PC and found you could reduce it a lot. Like you could refresh the DRAM four times a second or even two times a second and it would still work. Now, can you go ahead and do this? No, I'll tell you why. Because when IBM made stuff, they did not mess around. They used high quality components, high quality DRAM. And even though the specs say, if you don't keep refreshing at every number of you know microseconds or whatever, it'll fade, in practice, it didn't fade. So you could get away with it. But so you may be thinking, oh, well, then that, should I do this? And the answer is no, because on no-name, cheap Chinese clones and other marginal clone systems of the time, they did not spend as much money on RAM as IBM did. They used cheap RAM. And those, even if you do the small tolerances that got that 5% speed up, even that would cause the machine to crash. And so you so don't do it. Not only that, but some really out there clones like the um, the Commodore PC3 and uh, I, I think the Amstrad 1640. Some of the more strange clones don't even have their ports in the same location, and so you could be sending a value to a port to change the DRAM refresh, and you're actually doing something stupid like uh, turning on keyboard click or or doing something or, or crashing the system. So. Is it possible for a non-toy application? Not really. Should you reduce DRAM refresh at all? Not really. This was really fun. I had a great time. I think this worked out really well. Uh, I'd be happy to continue doing question and answer videos. If you have a question that you'd like me to answer for the next Q&A video, feel free to leave it as a question in this video's comment section, and I will get to it in the next video. Um, you can also reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at MobyGamer on Twitter. And uh, I guess until next time, um, stay safe, stay well, and thanks for the questions.